Over the last few weeks, I've just again and again considered the, the sense of confusion, disruption that the disciples of the early church must have gone through after the ascension of Jesus Christ. Having journeyed with the rabbi for three years, um, listening to him teach, listening to him talk about the things that were on his heart and being able to do life with him on a regular basis. And then suddenly he's crucified, buried, and then the sense of elation because of his resurrection. But 40 days later, Jesus ascends into heaven. And I can just for a moment imagine the sense of disarray and confusion that must have reigned within the hearts and the lives of the disciples in that early time after Jesus' ascension. It was a time of rearrangement. They had to rearrange their lives. It was as if everything had come back to a place of zero and they had to rethink how they were going to do life, rethink how they were going to do their relationship with one another, how they were going to do relationship with God. And, and as I was considering that, just deeply overwhelmed by the sense of sameness that we are going through in this very time as a church. You know, without us being able to meet in buildings, without us being able to meet face to face um, in a physical way, um, it, it, it's caused a lot of rearrangement within the church. And it's had me thinking, how do we as a community of faith in this season rearrange our lives around the things that we could see from the early church as, as being important and perhaps being foundational and fundamental to the establishment of church and faith in a season where they had to rearrange so many things. And I want to read you a portion of scripture from Acts chapter 2, um, a well-known portion of scripture. But from verse 42 to verse 47, it, it just shares the thoughts on how the early church arranged their lives after the ascension of Jesus. The Bible says that every believer was faithfully devoted to following the teachings, the instructions of the apostles. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another, sharing communion and coming together regularly for prayer. A deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers were in fellowship as one body, and they shared with one another whatever they had. Out of generosity, they even sold their assets to distribute the proceeds to those who were in need amongst them. Daily, they met together in the temple and in one another's homes to celebrate communion. They shared meals together with joyful hearts and with tender humility. They were continually filled with praises to God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who were coming to life. What an incredible portion of scripture. But in these just few verses, I, I see that the, the disciples were, were faithfully devoted. There was a sense of extreme, loving, loyal commitment to a singular cause, something that drove them. And, and we see in this portion of scripture that they were given over to, to certain things. They, they made sure that these things were the things that they rearranged their lives around. The first thing was the apostles' teaching, as the Bible describes it for us. They rearranged their lives around this. Now, for me, when I think about this, you know, it's more than just it's doctrine. Doctrine has become in our day and age just a statement of faith, the things that we believe in. But when I think the early church gathered in the sense when the apostles would teach, when there'd be a, a sense of, of awe considering the word of God, it, it, it's as if the disciples in that time arranged their lives around more than just a sermon or little portions of scriptures that they would memorize, but there was a deep sense of rearranging their lives on the deep-seated foundation of the Word of God. 
it was as if there is a measure that of wisdom that is connected to the foundation of building your life on the word of God. That deeply challenged me because I, I do believe that in this day and age that you and I live in and in this crisis, building on the foundation of the word is a fundamental principle for me and you to rearrange our lives. I'm not saying that people have not done this in a time of crisis, but it is the crisis that often highlights to our lives the sense of foundational living. When I read the scriptures in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 to 7, I read these words. And, 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 and in reading them again in my preparation for this talk, I, I was so deeply touched by this. When Paul writes this letter to Timothy, he says, You must continue to advance in strength with a truth wrapped around your heart, being assured by God that he's the one who has truly taught you all these things. Remember what you were taught from your childhood, from the scriptures, which you can impart, uh, which can impart to you wisdom to experience everlasting life. I love that. It's, it's as if Paul says, listen, the scriptures building your life on a foundation of his word brings life to your life. And in this time when people are filled with fear, uh, people are filled with confusion and perhaps even mourning a sense of loss, you know, loss of income, loss of health, loss of relationship, loss of connectivity. Um, it, it, we have to rearrange our lives again, foundationally, around the word of God. Paul co continues to say that every scripture has been written by the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. It will empower Power you by its instruction and correction, giving you the strength to take the right direction and lead you deeper into the path of godliness. Then you will be God's servant, fully mature and perfectly prepared to fulfill any assignment that God gives you. So here in the New Testament, I see the church after the ascension of Jesus in a time of 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 having to rearrange life, the first thing that they fully devoted their lives to was the word of God. I want to encourage you to, in this season, fully devote your life, to build your life on the foundation of Christ and his word. But in our portion of scripture from Acts, I see a second principle. I see how they rearranged their lives around fellowship now, that's an interesting, you know, when we think about fellowship, um, we immediately think about how restricted we are. You know, we're not allowed to do this. You can't meet in groups. You, The other day, um, I, uh, Sheree and I went just to go and pick up some supplies at, at, at the, our local Aldi. And um, as we're going down the aisle, you know, making sure that we keep uh, physical distance between other customers, here from the front of the aisle suddenly comes my sister. And I had the most awkward experience. At, at seeing my sister in the Aldi and my natural instinct would be to walk up to her and to give her a hug and ask how she's doing and and I can't and in that moment I, I was so deeply overwhelmed by the sense of 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 how relationship and how fellowship needs to be redefined for all of us in this season and yes, we recognize that the season will end. It will change again. But whilst we find ourselves in it, I, I do want to deeply challenge you about your connectedness, your faithful devotion to fellowship. You know, fellowship is, is much more than just gathering in, in, in the pub for a beer or, or being able to hug my sister in the oldie. It's, fellowship is is more about just the, the places that we we go to where we see people, our workplaces, perhaps, you know, going to see family. There's something in the scripture about fellowship that feels almost like reclining at the table. If you can get a picture of Jesus and the disciples that would have a meal together and they would recline at the table, they would spend life literally doing life together. There's something about fellowship that imparts grace to our lives. 
And this to me is the essence of fellowship. It's the way in which we have the privilege and the opportunity to impart grace to one another. I, I want to encourage you in the season of rearranging that we rearrange our lives around the sense of imparting grace. When you're in a family phone call and, and everybody's on video, that you would make a moment to impart grace. When you're writing an email or a text message or a WhatsApp message to someone, that you would find the space and the privilege to impart grace. You know, in this season that we find ourselves in, not of social distancing, but of physical distancing, because socially we want to connect. We want to connect in this way. We want to Zoom people. We want to be able to see our people. And whilst we can't be in each other's presence physically, nothing of the fundamental principles of Scripture changes in this season. The Bible is filled with something called the one another concepts. And, and I don't have time to read all of them to you today, but... Here are just a few that I thought might be relevant. Listen to how each one of these scriptures imparts grace in the moment. Galatians 6 verse 2, carry one another's burdens. James 5 16, pray for one another. Hebrews 3 13, warn one another. Galatians 5 13, serve one another in love. 1 Peter 4 verse 9, Practice hospitality to one another. And this one was deeply touching. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2 and 3. And it says, bear life with one another. And, and here we find in the early church a, a sense of rearranging life. Rearranging life around the word of God. And rearranging life around fellowship. I want to encourage you. Stay connected. Stay in fellowship. Make sure that you receive grace and that you find yourself giving grace in this time. In Acts chapter 2, there was a third thing that the early church rearranged their lives around. They rearranged their lives around what they called the breaking of the bread. Communion. This one was quite challenging for me. You know, communion is something we do when the church gathers and, and, and maybe once a month, depending on your tradition, others have it on a weekly basis. But there was something about the breaking of the bread that I found deeply challenging because the early church rearranged their lives around this meal. And so I want to encourage you in this time that perhaps you as an individual or as a family, or as a couple, spend regular time in breaking the bread. You see, communion is more than just bread and wine. Communion is more than us just, you know, remembering from a sentimental perspective that Jesus died and was raised for us. But communion in its essence carries the weight of our identification with his death and resurrection. In essence, the bread and the wine does not just say that Jesus died and was raised. In essence, the bread and the wine says, I died and was raised into a new life. It proclaims something of the sovereignty and the authority and the favor of God over my life. And that's why I think the early church spent time to rearrange their lives around the breaking of the bread. You know, the breaking of the bread does a few things. It, it was at the breaking of the bread that people's eyes were opened. Just think about the two gentlemen that, that traveled with Jesus from Jerusalem to Emmaus. It was at the breaking of the bread that we discern the body of Jesus. We are the body of Jesus. And can I tell you in this time of sickness and, and, and threat to our lives in a physical way, it is important that we recognize and discern that we are the body of Jesus. There was something else that happened at the breaking of the bread. It was a way in which the early church publicized not only the death of Jesus, but their inclusion in that. It wasn't just a way for them to publicize the ascension of Jesus, 
but also to include themselves in that. You see, Jesus did not just die for me, but he died as me. And that's why the early church had to rearrange their lives around the breaking of the bread. I'm deeply challenged. We as a church have decided that at every single engagement we have in this season, and, 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 and this season might not pass for us in that sense, but at every single engagement we will serve communion. So if you log into one of our devotionals or into one of our Sunday celebrations, somewhere during that time of ministry, there'll be communion. Because we want to be reminded. We want to rearrange our lives around this principle. Here's the final one. They rearranged their lives around prayer. So they rearranged around the word. They rearranged around fellowship. They rearranged around the breaking of the bread. And they rearranged around the thinking about prayer. Now, prayer was, was, was more than just, you know, discussion with God. Prayer was going beyond the boundaries of the flesh to declare something of the victory and the words of God over our lives. When I read the New Testament's writing about prayer, um, there's some fascinating scriptures, one of which is in James chapter 5. Listen to what it says. It says the prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. And I read that and and. and I was deeply challenged, you know, because as church, it's easy for us just to sit back in this moment and and consider in our thinking that the government is doing everything to protect us. And and we're taking measures by distancing ourselves physically from other people. And, you know, shops are closed and businesses are closed and, and we're not going out anymore and, and all these things. And and, and let me tell you, it, it becomes almost a sense of false hope, not because it's it's false but because we want to display during this time that our faith firstly is rooted in God who is the authority over our lives and that's why this verse deeply speaks to me because the prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with can I encourage you in your times of prayer that this becomes something that you faithfully devote your life around. Individual prayer and corporate prayer. The church, and I'm speaking about the church across the United Kingdom, has a role to play in terms of our prayers. Uh, when James writes these thoughts, he goes a little bit further. He says, Elijah, for instance, was human just like us. You know, and, and here we are, human. You know, you think of yourself as an ordinary person living an ordinary life in extraordinary circumstances. And that was similar to what Elijah found himself in. And the Bible says he was just a normal human being like me and you. But he prayed that it wouldn't rain. And he didn't. Not a drop for three and a half years. And then James says, then he prayed and it did rain. The showers came and everything started to grow again. And here's what I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to, to connect yourself to times of life giving prayer. And so, you know, just with these four simple thoughts, I want to encourage you to, in this season, make sure that you're rearranging your life. In the natural our lives have been rearranged for this season at least. But here's what I want to challenge you. That we now also spiritually rearrange our lives. That we would rearrange around the word of God. That we'd rearrange around fellowship. That we would rearrange around the breaking of the bread. And above all that we would rearrange around times of life giving prayer. There was a man called Todd Hunter. He was the successor to John Wimber, who started the vineyard movement. And he said these simple words. He said, the church that I would build would be a community of people who believe the gospel so much that they would actually 
rearrange their lives around it. And that's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for you as an individual, for you in your marriage, your family, if that's where you find yourself, in your health, in your finances in this season, that we would find ourselves above all, above all these things, rearranging around that which his word compels and invites us to do. Please let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that I can pray over every precious person that is listening to this word. Um, I want to pray, Lord, that as the early church had to rearrange their lives, I pray that you would give us grace, that you would give us boldness and courage to rearrange in a way that would reflect your glory in our lives and in our city during this time. Father, I pray for each one listening to me through this word. I pray, Lord, may they find a sense of your word becoming alive. May they discover how fellowship reignites a sense of faith and commitment to you in a beautiful way. Lord, may our fellowship go beyond the boundaries of us just connecting, but may, may they become spaces of grace in which you reveal yourself. I pray, Lord, as we eat bread, as we drink wine, as we celebrate your death and resurrection, that we would be reminded of ours and that we would find ourselves repositioned in a place of faith and favor during this time. Lord, as we engage you in prayer, may we discover many, many, many glorious moments in which our lives are deeply touched and our communities shaken with the faith and the hope and the love that we discover in you. And I pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. And amen. God bless you. Thank you for this privilege and this opportunity to share with you. Look forward to doing so again soon. Take care.